Hello there, I'm Gary Stearman, and this is Prophecy Watchers. We have a very special guest with us today. His name is Tim Chafee. Tim, welcome to Prophecy Watch. Uh, Gary, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. We're going to talk about Tim's book, a, a very, very well-written, by the way, and well-researched book. And it's called Fallen, the Sons of God and the Nephilim. Now, that word Nephilim, you, you told me before we started today that you that's the way you pronounce it. Yep, that's right, Nephilim. And if you pronounce it that way, it's got to be right. <laughs> <laughs> if I could just persuade my wife that that's the way it works. <laughs> now, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 4, it says there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same <clears throat> became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Now, you, you do a lot with that sentence. Yeah, how much time do we have? <laughs> I've got almost 500 pages. 500 pages here. And, and, by the, and I think it's a work uh, worth doing because it helps us to understand the rest of the Bible. It does. Yeah, and it, it was one that uh, I've always been curious about it. You know, I've, you saw me, before, we've got a picture of us standing together and I'm, I'm yeah. about six foot nine. So it, people have called me giant all the time and they'll call me this word Nephilim and they don't even understand that's plural. It would be Nephil, it's singular. But um, so I thought, well, what, I, I have an idea what this is and I, I think I know what it is, but let me do a lot of research. So I did my okay. THM thesis on the topic and as I was doing that, I realized there's a lot more in the Bible about this than I ever imagined. And so I started to turn that thesis into a lay level book and it kept growing and growing and became what we have here. And, you know, when I, I do speaking uh, for Answers in Genesis as well, I work at the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter as the content manager. So I, I write the signs that people read when they go through those two attractions. Um, but people will always come up to me afterwards and I and I know what question they're going to ask. They're the person waiting in the back, just waiting to ask me about the son, about the Nephilim. And as a ministry, we don't take an official position. So I have to always remind people of that. Um, so what people are hearing today are my own views, not necessarily that of the ministry. But um, yeah, people are so curious about it because it's, it's strange. It seems to kind of come out of nowhere. And well, when you talk about the Nephilim, uh, what comes into my mind is a Greco-Roman history, mm. Assyrian, Babylonian history. They all had giants yep. and, and, and statues of giants, and they had uh, carvings on the, the walls of their edifices with the giants. And the, you, we've all seen the, the carvings uh, uh, showing human beings bringing gifts, and they're about this tall, <laughs> and, and the people to whom they are bringing the gifts are about this tall. Mm -hmm. on the, and... We remember the Bible talks about giants, you know, and we remember we remember Goliath and, and other things. And we, we say, okay, well, how does all this fit together? And where did those giants come from? And were they the gods of Greco-Roman culture? Because, you know, the, the, uh, the gods that, that are spoken of in, in the old times, uh, you might call them giants. And maybe not. So, so where do we go from there? Yeah, I think you see quite a few things in Genesis 1 through 11 that the Bible is giving us the real history of what truly happened. Okay. That's inspired by God okay. and Moses is writing that down. But then we have throughout the world and all these different ancient cultures, echoes of that history. So you see this idea of man being made from the dust of the ground. You find that in cultures around the globe. The reason man dies or the reason that man has become wicked has something to do with a tree and or a serpent. We find that all around the globe. We find hundreds of flood legends. We find uh, a couple of, do two dozen Babel legends that sound just like very similar to what's in the Bible. Yes. And it's because people had this shared history in Genesis 11 before Babel, and they took that with them when they, they scattered around the globe, and then they started passing it down generation after generation. And you get distortions, kind of like the telephone game. But the other thing that appears in a lot of those cultures is before a big flood, you had angelic beings or you had the gods coming down, mating with women and producing demigods, which sounds very similar to what you read in Genesis 6, where the angelic beings, certain ones rebelled, mm -hmm. married women, had children with them, and they were mighty men, men of all, they were giants. And so I think in some of those cultures, you're getting <clears throat> distorted pictures of what the Bible is telling us. Well, if I can interrupt for just a moment, I've, I, I see in our contemporary society 
uh, that mythology being reborn on, on on television. You know, almost 24/7, you can find a program about ancient aliens that are coming down, and and uh, they are about to come back once again, as they did in the past, and and uh, they probably will be giants, and who knows? Mm -hmm. But we're we're we seem to be recycling some of those old mythologies right now. Yeah, you even see it in in a lot of movies, like the Marvel movies. You have Thor, who's a, a god, a Norse yeah, god, and he, he's in love with a human woman. And you have other films like that as well, where it does seem as if our culture is being prepared for something like that. Now, I'm not, I'm not fully persuaded that the Bible tells us that they will be back. I don't know that you can prove that from Scripture. You know, Jesus talked about how in the days of Noah, they'd be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. But he doesn't, He's talking about the sudden, the suddenness of his appearing, that people weren't expecting it. They were, they were just going about their daily lives. He didn't necessarily say everything that was happening in Genesis 6 has to be happening again. But it's within the realm of possibility that something like that would happen. Okay, now moving through the Old Testament, uh, we've talked about the, the Nephilim. And there's another class. And I remember when uh, Abraham <clears throat> had a great battle uh, with the four kings. Mm -hmm. And... And in that battle, mixed in and around and, and through it, were uh, were other giants, giant giant uh, cultures. The Emim and the Zuzim. Emim yeah. and Zamzumim yeah. and Zuzim and all of those people. Uh, where, where do they fit with Genesis 4? So, uh, with Genesis 6, they, so the Bible tells us in Genesis 6, 4. That uh, Genesis they, 6, yeah, 4. It tells us that, that the Nephilim, the giants were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. And the next word is so key to understanding that a, a lot of our Hebrew grammars uh, will tell us that next word should not be translated as when, but whenever. And if you understand that, that passage becomes so clear. It's telling us, mm. Moses is telling us the Nephilim, the giants were on the earth before the flood. And also after the flood, whenever the sons of God did this. So in other words, they did it before the flood, they did it after the flood. So the giants were about, they came around after the flood because the sons of God did this again. These angelic beings did that same sort of activity. And so you do have these giant clans. And you know what, Genesis 14 is that chapter when people say, uh, people have asked me, do you ever wish there was more in the Bible? Yes, I wish Genesis 14 was twice as long. I want to know... <laughs> <laughs> Not just how, I know how they came about, but yes. how do they lose? The side with the giants and the side that lost to Ketileomer. Right. And well, who is that guy that he's coming with these other armies to defeat all these giant clans? I want to know more about these people, but God doesn't tell us everything that we want to know. He tells us enough. He tells us enough. Yeah. We have uh, the Israelites spying out the land and finding giants there. Mm -hmm. Kiryat Arba, where the home of a, of a giant, was kind of run by giants at one time. You know, it's, it's interesting you bring that, that up because that's the city is, is Hebron, Kiryat Arba. Heb and, yes. and every time it mentions that, it says, which is Hebron. And it, it, it always puts it in parenthetical. Like to, There's something significant about that place. Well, it's the place where Abraham was told, your descendants are going to, I'm going to give this land to them in Genesis 15 and 17. And they're going to go down to a land that's not their own. They're going to come back to this land. He was in Hebron when that happened. And so when the Israelites come back to the land, guess where those giants seem to be headquartered? Hebron. Hebron. It's like Satan saying, we're going to stop you from coming back. And God said, no, you're not. And to this very day, there's a, a very large edifice at, at Hebron that people visit, you know, and, uh, and check out and, and to try to rebuild the, 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 the scenery of biblical history. Hmm. They look at that. And, and yet, yet I, I remember when I was in, at Hebron, I kept thinking of giants while I was there. As hmm. a matter of fact, I was, the, the, in the, what, would, what would this landscape look like? But um, again, I think to me, the mystery of the giants is why did God allow them? What part did they really play in Old Testament history? Uh, when did they come in? When did they leave? Et cetera, et cetera. And you've done a, a terrific job of researching that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think that they were a, a, an attempt by the enemy to thwart God's plan. And that is that God says he's going to send his, uh, the seed of the woman is going to defeat the serpent. And I think what you see in Genesis 6 is this attempt to, to corrupt that line. And before it gets corrupted, God wipes out every, you know, everybody except for Noah and his family with the flood. And then you still have that line from Noah to Abraham. Right. And then you see this promise being made to Abraham. And he tries to prevent them from coming back into the land using the giants again. But that doesn't prevent them. In fact, at one, one of the battles in Joshua's day against the Amorites, who are also called giants, um, 
they are, God is the one who stops the sun or the, the earth from spinning so that you have the extra long day. And he's throwing down hailstones. More people are, more of the giants are killed by the hailstones than by the Israelites. So God is making sure that those individuals are not stopping his plans from coming to pass. And then eventually they seem to fade from the pages of scripture after David's time. And David's mighty men fought against uh, some of these giants in, in Gaza and Gath. And that's where Goliath was from, was that from that area. Um, and after that, they seem to fade. And I think part of the reason is you don't need them anymore if you're going to fight a battle. You have weapons that can be fired from a long distance and a giant isn't going to win you a battle anymore. Back in the days of hand-to-hand -hand combat, yeah, they would. <laughs> that's true. <clears throat> Talk unless, to unless you fight a, guy, a, young, a young guy with a sling, maybe not. But <laughs> We're going to continue this discussion talking to Tim Chafee, author of Fallen. And it's all about the sons of God and the Nephilim. Uh, let's pause for a moment because uh, we publish a uh, monthly magazine called The Prophecy Watcher. And uh, holding one of them right now, pause just to tell you how you can uh, get the monthly magazine. In case you haven't noticed, the whole world is spinning out of control, but we are not surprised because many of the things taking place were prophesied in the Bible thousands of years ago. That's why we want to offer you a very special subscription to our magazine, The Prophecy Watcher, that will keep you on the cutting edge of Bible prophecy. Stay informed on prophetic world events. Follow the nuclear threats from Russia and Iran, China's march to world domination, the likelihood of another global pandemic, the rise of artificial intelligence and transhumanism, war in the Middle East, the UFO phenomenon, and the latest technology preparing the world for the mark of the beast. With your gift of $50 or more to support the worldwide outreach of Prophecy Watchers, you will receive 12 issues of the magazine in either print or digital format. You will also receive 10 bonus DVDs that feature in-depth teaching on the ancient book of Enoch, heaven and the new Jerusalem, the biblical case for the rapture, a look at how God put the gospel in the stars, what really happened at the Tower of Babel, and Ezekiel's prophecy on the battle of Gog and Magog. This special offer is available anywhere in the United States with free shipping included. Don't wait. Pick up the phone right now and call the toll-free number on your screen or visit us at prophecywatchers.tv. Stand with us today and help us take the message of Christ's soon return to the whole world. And welcome back. Continuing our conversation, very interesting conversation with Tim Chafee. Now, could we be seeing a return of this class of, of people today? Have you ever given any thought to maybe the return of the giants? Yeah, so I have, an, I have a chapter toward the end of the book, and it's the one that was probably the most disturbing to write. And it was, my goal in writing this was to write the most detailed Bible study on this topic. So I didn't want to get into the speculative stuff until very close to the end. Like, I've yes. already made my point. I've proven this case, I, I believe. Now let me get into those other things that people really wonder about and I need to speculate. I think what you might be seeing historically are certain attempts to duplicate this. Uh, so you have in medieval times, you have like the um, incubus and the succubus or sylvans and fawns who are um, these, these spirits or demonic spirits apparently that were molesting women or men in the middle of the night. And then you have something kind of similar with the, the alien abduction scenarios where there's so many people, and I'm not saying everybody who talks about it is legit, but there seems right. to be way too many people from all over the world with nothing to gain by talking about this. Um, but they claim to be abducted. They claim to be probed some way, you know, it, 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 in ways that have to do with sexual activity. And there always seemed to be an emphasis on that. Maybe it's just to terrorize them. That would that would seem to work, but maybe they're attempting to do something like this again. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure because the Bible doesn't tell Perhaps us that's going on. Genetic manipulation of some sort, and yeah. you know, and I, I believe the Bible is full of genetic uh, hanky pank, shall we say, uh, on uh, on the part of Satan who's trying to corrupt the human genome, and of course the genealogy uh, down to Christ. Uh, from from the opening books of the Old Testament, that the, the genealogy that would that would eventually come to 
Nazareth is, is a very important genealogy, and Satan was trying to to uh, disturb it, to foul it up in mm -hmm. any way he could, and he did not succeed, thank heaven. Right. <laughs> but again, there, there's this genealogical uh, stream of information that runs through the entire Bible all the way to the end. And it strikes me, and I and, and it was stimulated by your book in a way, even even more so, that Satan is in the business of mangling the human genome, mixing it up any way he can, destroying it, disturbing it, and that maybe these sons of God had a part in that, or they were a byproduct of it. I don't know, but. It, uh, these thoughts were stimulated as I read your book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that he's doing whatever he can to corrupt humanity. Um, I don't think that we should be shocked that he's been doing this from the very beginning, doing what he can to corrupt humanity. And I think as Christians, we've become so comfortable in the West with thinking that the devil really can't do anything. Mm -hmm. He's just, okay, yeah. he's a liar, and maybe he'll tempt you to do a few little things, but no, he's a deceiver, he's deceiving nations, and I think we're we're reaping the whirlwind, so to speak, in our culture right now. But not only is he a deceiver, he apparently tampers with human beings and tries to destroy God's plan. Mm -hmm. And he's still in that business, which is an amazing thing and really shows up when you, uh, when you study this subject. Yeah, I agree. Uh, he's, uh, he's, done it, he's done it throughout the Old Testament. You see it in other areas today where he's trying to stop God's plan from coming true. Look what he's been trying to do to the Jewish people throughout history. Yes. And God has made this promise to the Jews that, you know, that, that he's going to return to that land and they're going to be in that land and he, the, the, all Israel shall be saved. Romans eleven twenty six 26 talks about, but if he can, if the enemy can wipe out all of the Jewish people, well, that can't come true. And he sure seems to be trying, um, but he won't succeed. He will not succeed. And that, of course, we know that's one of the articles of our faith. But again, the idea of uh, the sons of God and the Nephilim is a huge idea that runs all the way through the Bible. And even <clears throat> into uh, the epistles and, and the book of Revelation, I think, because these, these individuals in the book of Revelation and, and their offspring are, are released uh, during the time of the tribulation. And you see them sort of making a comeback. Yeah, and just as before, they're going to be put down. So <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever the enemy tried to do. I mean, he, he's going to succeed in corrupting a lot of people and deceiving a lot of people and harming and, and leading people to a Christless eternity. But ultimately, he will fail because the Bible is very clear on this point that, that God is going to be victorious. Now, you, and I'm going to look at the uh, table of contents here and just to give you an idea of what's in this book. Uh, the view of, the, of these, uh, these beings, the Sethite view, the royalty view, <clears throat> the Psalm 82, the divine counsel. Y you know, it's, and uh, the fallen angel view, you give several views of that. And then you move away from the fallen, fallen angel view uh, and you ask the question in one chapter, do angels have the ability to procreate? I'm trying to give, give you a, an idea of, uh, of what Tim's writing about. And really, you cover a, a huge area. That, that was my goal. As I mentioned, I wanted it to be the most detailed Bible study. So rather than just stating, here's my position, take it or leave it. It was, here are the other views that are out there, the, the Sethite view, the royalty view. Give them a fair hearing. Show the, yeah. the arguments against them, why they, I believe that they fall apart, why they don't hold up. And then give my view and the arguments for that view. But I also have five chapters of arguments against the fallen angel view. And I think it can answer all of them. Hmm. Um, but there are a lot of people who raise objections, and I wanted to make sure all of those were heard. And I've, I'm pretty sure the book will include many that people haven't even heard before because I've been hearing them for a long time. I thought, well, that's going into the book. But I think it's the only view that makes sense of the text, the grammar. It's the only one that explains how the Nephilim were on the earth before the flood and after the flood. And it's the only one that can stand up to all the objections because it's the one that the Bible teaches. Here's a question that people will have. I'm still looking at Genesis 6, giants in the earth in those days. And then, uh, you, of course, you, you have the flood. <clears throat> the earth dries out. Everybody's talking about megalithic architecture all over the world. And they're trying to reconstruct historically uh, this giant culture mm -hmm. that was worldwide. And now, how do you, from a biblical perspective, how, how do you explain that to somebody who asks? And by the way, this is becoming a hotter and hotter topic. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm not completely convinced that the giants have to be there to be making me megalithic structures. I mean, it does seem like, okay, well, the bigger you are, I'm a big guy, but I still can't lift a 10,000 pound stone or anything. <laughs> right. Pe people are ingenious. So yeah. people are building Stonehenge, people building the Great Pyramid just a few hundred years after, after, the, after Babel. And we look at that today and we marvel, but it's just human ingenuity is capable of doing some of those things. Now, there might be other structures where yeah, giants might be the best explanation for that, but I don't think that we, if it is a megalith, I don't think we have to automatically assume, well, this proves the Bible, what it was saying about giants. Perhaps they were involved in that. Um, but uh, people, uh, yeah, people are, there are a lot of people a lot smarter than me when it comes to mechanical stuff who can figure out, hey, here's how we can lift that 10,000 pound stone. And maybe you've seen it in Israel before where, you know, the um, ashlar stones that are part of the Temple Mount that Herod used, yes. they actually would turn those into the axle. Uh, they put the two wheels on the side and then the stone itself is the axle. Then you just wheel that into to where it needs to go. And so I would have never thought of that. Hmm. But People think of those things. And <laughs> they do. Engineers and do. <laughs> we've all seen those stones and we've wondered. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is fascinating. Uh, and by the way, I'm, we're just getting in, into the good parts now and we're almost out of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the book is so long because there's so much to it. <laughs> there, it is a, a very heavy uh, book, but, but, um, but well-written oh, and well-researched. I have to say... Uh, your persistence in research uh, would certainly put mine in the shade because <laughs> you've got details within details within details here. For the people who really like details, this is your book. And uh, let's uh, pause just a moment here and uh, let you know how you can get a copy of Tim's book, Follow. Like many passages in the Bible, God doesn't always give us all the details, just enough for us to search out what's happening behind the scenes, the backstory, if you will. There's no better example of this than the controversial account we read about in Genesis 6. If we take the scripture literally, we read about an encounter between a group of angels who have left their heavenly home and the women of earth whom they take as wives. According to scripture, these fallen angels found the women of earth attractive, and together they created a hybrid race that threatened the existence of life on earth. It doesn't take long to connect the dots. Ultimately, this was part of an ancient battle between Jesus and Lucifer. Gary Stearman calls it the seed war. And what do we see happening in our world today? Gender confusion, DNA mapping, genetic manipulations, transhumanism, all designed for one purpose, to destroy the one thing God holds most precious, the lives of men and women, a special one-of-a-kind creation made in His image. Tim's new book, Fallen, may be the most comprehensive book ever written on the subject. We're making it available for your gift of $25 or more, with shipping included anywhere in the USA. And as always, it comes with a special DVD bonus on the subject, Gary Stearman's Footprints of the Nephilim, an hour-long live presentation that sheds light on a subject you've likely never heard about in church. Just call the 800 number you see on your screen or visit our bookstore at prophecywatchers.com. For our international friends, please note that additional shipping fees will apply and all payments must be made in U.S. dollars. If you find this subject as fascinating as we do, we created the Genesis 6 Enoch package. It includes Tim's new book, Fallen, along with a hardback collector's edition of the apocryphal book of Enoch. We've also added four bonus DVDs, Gary's Footprints of the Nephilim and It's All About the Seed, along with a two-hour interview on the book of Enoch with prophecy expert Ken Johnson. Tim's new book, The Enoch Book, and all four DVDs, a $100 value, are available for your gift of $65 or more to help support our television ministry. We believe the return of the Lord Jesus is very close. Scripture compares the events taking place in the days of Noah to events that will be taking place at the time of Christ's return. What do we see happening today? Transhumanism, super soldiers, artificial intelligence, and the words of Gary Stearman, Folks, we're there. Thanks for watching today, and may God bless you. 
Well, we're back, and uh, we really thank you for joining us today. And again, uh, I'd like to thank Tim Chafee because it, his book caused me to think in ways that I had not really thought before. And that's what a good book should do. Uh, well, thank what, you. I appreciate that. <laughs> what would you have people take away from this book? Uh, you know, it's going to sound a little strange, but I, one emphasis I would have is don't focus too much on the enemy and what he's doing. I, I think we need to focus on our creator, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done and what he's going to continue to do for us. Um, it's very tempting for people who go down this rabbit hole yes. to become fascinated by all the different things related to what the devil is doing. And let's take, let's not put our eyes on him. Let's set our minds on things above where Christ is. And let's, let's focus on that. It's important. This is an important topic because it's in God's word, but there are a lot of other things in God's word as well. And, and I, so I think we need to focus on what Christ is doing. And I know people will say, well, aren't you being hypocritical because you wrote this really long book? Uh, I did, and it was, a, it was a topic of my thesis, and I, and I wanted to do a biblical explanation of this topic, but I don't spend most of my time on this anymore. I, I, I want to make sure I'm focused on what God is doing. And uh, so, uh, yes, I want people to buy it. I want them to understand what the Bible says on this topic. Well, let's, let's end on a high note. Okay. Uh, we're, we're prophecy watchers here, and I know Tim is a prophecy watcher. Uh, give us your view of, of uh, prophetic events as they're coming uh, our way in, in this particular age in which we find ourselves. Yeah, I, um, well, let me tell you, Jesus is going to come back on, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, don't, I don't set dates. I, he told us very clearly we don't know the day or the hour. Not asking you to set, <laughs> set a date. No, no I, I think I think you, you look at what is happening in Israel, yeah. and I think that's the key um, I'm not one who looks at every single headline and says, well, this fulfills this verse. I, I, I don't think that's the right way to do it. Now, there are going to be times where that will come to pass. And just as this Bible said, this is going to happen. But I think you look at how the, the world seems to continually turn against Israel. And it's just, um, I'm not saying they're perfect and that we should back every single thing that their government ever says that they're supposed to do. But as Christians who serve a Jewish Messiah, who's uh, followed the teachings of the 12 apostles who were all Jewish. And uh, I think that we need to remember that uh, Paul said the gospel went to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And it is for the gospel for both Jew and Gentile. Uh, we need to have a love for, uh, for both. And um, it's, it's unfortunate that so many Christians have even in recent times started to, to turn against the Jewish people. I don't, I, I don't understand why that happens, but well, they are a people uh, of controversy, always have been, always will be, because right, they're right in the middle of God's plan. Exactly. And, and I think that we have some, somebody out there stirring and muddying the waters. Yes, and I his think His name so. is Satan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Chafee, thanks for joining us today. Oh, Gary, mm. thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. His book is called Fallen. Eh, you should give it a read. I'm Gary Steeron. Hey, you keep watching. We are. The media ministry of Prophecy Watchers exists only through the faithful prayer and financial support of friends like you. So, won't you do what you can to keep this teaching on the air? You can make your gift online at prophecywatchers.com. Thank you for your prayers and gifts.